In this series, we're looking at healthy homes and um, in a very scientific survey I did of about 10 people saying, how would you like to share about your healthy home? Everyone said, well, do you really want me? And uh, that's kind of the problem with home life is that whether you live in a bachelor pad or whether you live in a uh, just a, you're a married couple and there's just two of you or if you're a family, if you're a kind of just a complicated mix of people and there's a story behind the complexion of people that you live with. I suppose when people say, how, how healthy is your family? We're always so aware of the lack in our relationship or the lack in the way we connect with children or the lack of the way we connect with your parents. It's like, so how's, how's your home, kids, with your parents? And it's like, well, let me tell you all the issues I have with my parents right now. Or let me tell you all the issues or the things. Let me tell you about all the, the, the jobs. How, how's your home at the moment? Well, just let me tell you about all the jobs that aren't done. And it's kind of like we associate a home with being unfinished because it has to do with housework and it has to do with people and neither of them are ever finished. And, and so in this series, um, after Mother's Day, we're actually going to have some people share personally about their family experience, whether they be um, uh, single people, whether they be uh, people from large families, small families, people that are just living in different arrangements because we believe that um, God would speak to us each about how we leverage the households where God has planted us because we can have a disproportionate influence upon the people that we are living with. And some of us will be living with the same people we are now for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And some of us, there may be a season where we have a home life you know, you might be a student and you might be living with some people and you might only be living with them till the end of the year, but God has planted you where you are to represent Jesus in that environment. And I think it's very easy to be overwhelmed by the environment or the culture of our homes, to feel like I have no power to change my home structure. I'm a kid. How can I change my parents I'm a parent. How can I change my kids? I'm a wife. How can I change my husband? I'm a, you know, and it's like we often feel like there's nothing we can do. And I suppose this series, particularly in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be looking at some practical wisdom about family life. But this morning, I wanted to take a step back and just talk about what is the purpose of family? How does God see family? And some challenge for us as to how we might be good stewards of uh, the environment where God has planted us today. Um, every family is normal until you get to know them. And then when, well, growing up, I used to think my parents were the best parents in the world. And then I became a teenager and I thought that they were the worst parents in the world. And now I, I look back and I say, man, I have so much to be thankful for. But we often uh, define ourselves by, by our own experiences, but also reacting against our experience as well. I think there's some good news, though, um, for everyone here. Just Let me just say this as well. When we talk about family, often people are going to be like, oh, typical middle-class church talking about family values when the majority of us in this room are not even married. Well... The good thing is this message is not just about people that are married. It's about who are we as family and who is God calling you to be in your household no matter what the composition of your family. So I think it's relevant for everyone. Isn't it great that we're part of a church with so many different people from different walks of life? And I love the fact that we've got so many single people in our church and I love the fact that the Bible um, speaks so highly of singleness. I believe the, the Bible speaks, you can make a good point that the Bible speaks even higher of singleness than it speaks about marriage. Um, so so we, we believe that no matter where God has called you at the season of life where you are, there, in, there is intrinsic value and worth and purposefulness that you do not need to be completed by another human being. All right, so first point I want to make about home life is this. 
God has a family for you. You might want to just tell that to yourself. God has a family for me. You might want to whisper it to your neighbor. God has a family for you. And just that thought might clash with something in you because it might remind you of family lost. It remind, might remind you of some longings in your heart. But I think God would say to everyone that he has family for you. I want to have a look at a scripture from Psalm 68, a psalm of David. It says this from verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. Can everyone say that with me? God sets the lonely in families. What a beautiful scripture. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook and the heavens poured down rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. Your people settled in it, and from your bounty, God, you provided for the poor. I love this passage because it starts by talking about God being a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. The psalmist is saying that God is the ultimate parent and the ultimate partner. And the thing that's so true about this for me when we talk about family is that so many of us in this room need to know that those most fundamental relationships of parent and partner, God wants to be that for you. God wants to be that for you. And if you try to derive purpose and meaning from a biological parent or you crave that purpose and meaning from a biological parent, you will always crave the ultimate fathering that can only come from God the Father and mothering, actually. Nurturing, tender, tendering, tenderness and caring, leading, and partner. That whether you're in this room and you've got a really healthy partnership, a really unhealthy partnership or something in between, that you need to know that there is a partner that will walk beside you. In the words of Scripture, he will stick closer than a brother and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. God has a family for you. And some of you right now have got such fam tight family units and it's like they're, they're, they're impregnable and it's like you, you feel like you've got such a solid family. But let me tell you that nothing in this life is certain or forever. And some people, when family falls apart or family gets challenged, their lives fall apart because they have no greater context of being loved by the greatest love that there ever was. And so we all... Even from, I'm so thankful that I get to be the father of Amari, my daughter. But I make sure that I tell her about the father that will never let her get down. Because I prepare her already for the many times I will let her down. I don't want to, un, I don't want to belittle the, the pain of people that miss a parent. But I just want to say that you can miss a parent, but there is a fundamental need that can only be met by Father God. He is the father of the fatherless, defender of widows. God has family for you. And do you know what? For some of us in this room, there might be times where we feel like everyone else has abandoned us, but you are never abandoned because you always have your father and your partner right there with you. God is always your family. And so even when you feel like you're on your own, you are never without family. He sets the lonely in families. God is your family now. As Christians, we need to say that Jesus is my brother, that God is my father, and the Holy Spirit is my counselor, and he doesn't even charge $100 an hour. <laughs> God is your family now. I also want to say that God is your family, but you also belong to family that when you become a Christian, even before you believe all the right things, and even before you become all what you want to become, you belong to the people of God. You belong to a family. And sometimes the fact that we as Christians fail 
to be family to one another does not, un, does not undermine the truth that we are family. All that happens at church is sometimes we look across the room at each other a little bit like that second cousin that we see once a year at the Christmas gathering. We're like a little bit unsure about that person. I'm not sure if I'm going to actually talk to them this year. And so there's an unfamiliarity, but we are family. We have the same uh, connection, family connection, and we have the same future that we will be tied together as brothers and sisters forever. You see... God has a family for you. He is your family. You belong to this church family and the church of Jesus. I love the fact that when we're baptized in water, it's, it's saying that you, you're not just baptized in a ceremony. It's like you're baptized into a community of faith. You are part of a brotherhood and a sisterhood united in Christ, united with the Holy Spirit. I love it that it says God sets the lonely in families. And I believe that ultimately, even though God is your family, he can set you in a family, even if you've got no family. You might have no biological family, but he can set you in a family. I've seen it. There's people in this room that um, there's people that are like family to you that you've got no biological connection with. My grandmother, growing up, had a young uh, girl that was like a, a sister to her, and then her family ended up passing away. And... Growing up, I just assumed that she was part of our family because she, she got absorbed into our family, into the Cox family and then the extended Lockens family. And so God places the lonely in families. And I wonder, I wonder in this church at a profound level, not just how many people know that sometimes people aren't part of your home, but they're still part of your family. Yeah? So like you can have people in your life that have never lived in your home but there's a common thread that ties you together that you're saying I will always be for that person for the rest of my life I will always care for that person I will always be available to that person there's a kinship there's a connection there's a there's a connection in the spirit I wonder not just hey who can be that person for me but who can I be that person for who can I be family for? Who can I commit to? Who can I be like God? Because God has um, entered into a covenant with us. Who can I say, I want to be for you? It, no matter how many times you let me down, I always want to tell you there's a place in our family for you. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, he sets the lonely in families. Later in that scripture, it talks about God leading God's people out of the wilderness. Well, who actually, who led God's people out of the wilderness in, in the story of the Exodus? It was Moses. And Moses was led by God. See, God led the people out of slavery, out of Egypt, into the promised land where there would be prosperity, the land of milk and honey. And, and it's interesting, in that journey, there was a lot of tragedy. A lot of people would have lost loved ones. They would have lost family members. They would have lost children. They would have lost um, family connections. They would have lost so many things. But when they entered the promised land, it said that the people set it in, in from your bounty. And God, you provided for the poor. You see, the children of Israel, when they got liberated from slavery, God established them in the promised land so that there wouldn't, be need, there wouldn't need to be people that are poor and slaves anymore that they would actually be looked after the children of Israel were called to be a light to the nations that all the nations of the world would look in and say I can't believe the way you look after the orphans and the widows and the downtrodden that it's not like a separation between those that are in families and those that are outside families but you are almost like one family of the people of God now when we read the Old Testament we see that the people of God treated the poor and the lowly really badly and that's really sad and we as a church, we are called to not just be a clusters of families, but we are called to be family. Families are not the key to happiness or even purpose. Family is a very good thing, but if it's the most important thing in our life, it can become a bad thing. Sometimes I think we can be so loyal to our families that we're more loyal to our family than, we, than what we are to Christ. Sometimes we can be loyal or focus on our family agenda more than caring for a neighbour or caring for someone that's in trouble or caring for someone that's been wronged by a family member. And I think that's really important. God has a family for you. And if you're in a family, God wants you 
to see beyond your family because he sets the lowly in families. Amen? Second point, God has a household for you. So yeah, there's family, but then the, the Greek word in the New Testament is oikos, and it can be translated in, in different ways, but the most common way is household. And your household is, you know, it's the family, it's the, the parents, it's the kids, it's the aunt, it's the uncle, it's the grandparents, it's that person that's travelling for study and then they stay at your house and they never leave, it's the dog, it's the cat, it's the neighbour that has a problem with the plumbing and uh, so they have to live with you and then they never leave. And, you know, it's just like, so your household is your most intrinsic and basic sphere of influence, but it's not just biological family. But you know what I mean? Like, imagine if you had really good news in your life. Imagine if you won the lottery and you had to ring some people. You wouldn't just call your mum and your dad. You wouldn't just call your brother or your sister. You'd call that inner circle. That is the oikos. That is your household. And that is the realm of influence where you have the most influence in life. Let's have a look. John 4 verse 53. This is uh, the Roman centurion whose son was just healed. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his entire whole household believed. Um, we can read about the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 that he had a dramatic encounter with the love of God and it says he and his entire household were saved and then baptized. And so God cares about how Households. Isn't that good? If you're in a bachelor pad, God cares about bachelor pads. If you're just kind of in student accommodation, if you, you're in a, a retirement home, God cares about households. You might have family and they're interstate or they're overseas, but God has planted you in a household. And there is a sphere of influence over the people that you rub shoulders with weekly. And so praise God for family and praise God for households. Pra praise God and because, and, and that word oikos, it's, it's household, but it's also home. So it, it's connected with the place where, you, the space and the environment where you live. Acts 10, 24, it says, The following day he arrived, Peter arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Friends, what are they doing? This is a God fearing Gentile man, and he is awaiting the apostles to come to share with them. And they're praying and believing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like has happened in Acts chapter 2, and like has happened in Samaria in Acts chapter 8. And so they are awaiting this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so, these godly, this godly man, Cornelius, isn't that a great name? Aren't you glad we've got a man called Cornelius in our church? He's a legend. Any, anyway, um, he. So, so they're waiting, and what does he do? He doesn't just invite his wife. He doesn't just invite his favorite son. I'm sure his name was Timothy. But it says he is expecting the apostles and had called together his relatives and close friends. He even invited the aunts and the cousins. He invited his relatives, and he even invited his close friends. This is what Oikos is all about. This is what a household is all about, that there is a sphere of influence, and it's bigger than your biological family. Isn't it good that God has placed us in households to have an influence? I'm so thankful that um, a couple of weeks ago we took my son Jude up to Minato Zoo for his third birthday. I can't believe he's three. And uh, we had my wife, Nikki and I, and, and our kids, and we had the cousins and um, Stephanie and Michael, Nikki's sister and brother-in-law. And we also had uh, two young adults from our church, uh, Gannett and Ashley as well. And we believe in having a high adult to child ratio whenever we're around, around animals that could kill you. Um, and it was just great. And, and, I look, and I look around that gathering when we went up and I thought, and, and sorry, and Bill and Kathy were there as well, um, my in-laws. <laughs> Don't tell them I forgot them. Um, and, and, and we had a great time. And I, I was thinking that really is an expression of a household. That's, it's an extended household. I'm so grateful that um, a, a few years ago we were blessed to be able to um, have Gannett, who's sitting down there, come and live with us and essentially become part of our family. And uh, my son Jude, who's now three, has never really known the world without Gannett. 
Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, I'm sure he loves you when he's not telling you to go away, Gannett. Um, but, but it's just been an absolute joy that this young woman that was really needing a place to live and a place to stay because of a really difficult season in her life, that we had a room available and it, we just felt in God, hey, we want to invite her to come and live with us uh, for a period of six months and that six months has now become nearly three years and it's been an absolute joy and um, she's now part of our family and, and we've got a, another beautiful young adult girl in our church called Ashley. I don't know if Ashley's here, but she'll regret it because I'm talking about her. Um, and Ashley's a beautiful young girl and she looks after our kids. She helps us with our kids in the afternoons and she just does such a great job and my kids, you know, when they're cross with me, they're like, oh, go away, I want Ashley. And um, Jojo's walking, he's probably looking for Ashley right now. Um, and, and it's just great. And I look around, I'm just like, God, I'm so thankful that my kids have got Gannett in their life. I'm so thankful that my kids have got Ashley in their life. And it's an absolute joy. And you know what I love as well? When your household gets extended, you get more people coming through. Like, um, since Gannett's come to live with us, we've had so many more conversations with young adults and just different people, whether it be people that we don't have connection with, but now we do, coming in. And when someone comes into your home, you hear their stories. Like at church, you can often only have shorter conversations, but when someone's in your home and you spend more time with them, you can hear their stories and you can have a greater empathy and understand. And they can see you how you are. They can see you when you're grumpy and yelling at the kids. They can see you when you're tired. They can actually get to know you at a deeper level. And so I believe that God has a household for you. I wonder if there's a neighbor in your life or someone that's just in your geographical proximity that God actually wants you to open up the door and say, come and be part of my household. I was reading this um, great quote. I, I remember actually when my, when my parents were being generous. It annoyed me so much. It was Christmas time and they invited this young guy from church and he'd come from a, a drug-dependent background and, and so they, he had nowhere to go on Christmas Day and they invited him over for Christmas and mum proceeded to go to the Christmas tree, take away all of my presents, well, it, all the good ones, and scrub my name out and put a sticker over it with his name and she gave my presents to this guy. Is anyone feeling the injustice of this situation? <laughs> am, am I feeling any empathy in the room? Anyway, so, and, and I remember feeling like my parents had done such a wrong thing because they had violated the sacredness of our family special time. But, but do you get what I mean? It's like, you're wrecking our family special time, our family memories. And now I look back and I think, what an idiot I was. I was probably pretending or professing to be a Christian at the time, but I completely missed the point of Christmas. I know some of you in this room at Christmas time, you look across a church like ours or you look across people in your family and you think through who might not have anywhere to go this Christmas. And you think about saying, come and eat with me. But then some of us, we're really caught up with our family that we're not really thinking about the people that are a little bit on the outer, the people that maybe aren't connected with families. And we need to do better as a church and as the people of God to provide a space for someone. Because sometimes people are trying to follow Jesus, but the lure of the old life is pulling them away. Or the lure of just being so utterly lonely or feeling abandoned that ultimately God is saying, hey, there's a place at your table and that person is, play, is praying for a family they're praying to be part of something beyond their own isolated lives. You're the answer to their prayer. I think we can grow as a church in this area. So God has a family for you. God has a broader household that he wants you to be part of. Actually, I'll, I'll read the quote because... Um, thanks, Sam. Sam just texted me. An encouragement. Um, this is from a fantastic communicator called Rosaria uh, Butterfield. And she, she says this, Cass sent this to me before and it was just fantastic. She says, if you're not sharing the gospel with a house key, especially with people for whom crushing loneliness is killing them faster, if you're not doing that, why not? So what she's talking about is if you're sharing the good news of Jesus but you're not giving people access to your lives then how are you really helping them with their 
desperate loneliness. Um, because 1 Corinthians 10.13 is for all of us. It says, No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. Butterfield says this, What if your house is a way of escape, but you are too busy? What if there's someone... You know, we as a church call people, if, if someone's living in a toxic uh, de facto relationship and they're just saying, oh, I need to get out of this relationship, it's hurting me and it's, it's destroying my relationship with Christ, and they're saying, I want to follow Christ, but then they're on their own, they've lost their support network, they've lost their partner, how are we as a church providing a home for them? Or are we just giving them a handshake on a Sunday? We need to actually invite people into our homes and give them access to our lives. And it's not just about one or two people. It's about we as a body of many hundreds of people choosing to be family for the people within our church and beyond. So God has a family for you. God has a household for you. And you know, sorry, you know what you can do as well? How many of you in this room have leftovers at the end of dinner time? Just put your hand up. Okay. So, like, if you invited one more person to your house for tea once a week, the chances are you wouldn't even have to cook anymore. Isn't that good? I mean, or you could just spend an extra, like, 15 cents on extra pasta, and everyone will be covered. So um, everyone can do this. Just be a little bit more hospitable as we go on our way. My final point is this, and yes, final point, we're finishing early. Praise God. God wants to build a house for us. Anyone looking to build a house? Well, God wants to build your house for you. Psalm 127 verses 1 to 2 says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers work in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I think a few things about this scripture uh, really impact me. First of all, the person that wrote this psalm is contrasting building a house with building a family, with building a home. Uh, like, yeah, the, building a house with building a family. And we remember back in 2 Samuel when King David is saying to God, shall I build a temple for you? And God says to David, you will not build a temple for me because you've got too much blood on your hands, but I will build a lineage from you. I will build a family from you. And from your family will come the Messiah, the Son of God in the flesh. And so God, in the same way here, it starts with this metaphor of building, but then in the next verse, it starts talking about rearing children and being a parent. So this idea of building, and, and anyone that's been a parent, you know, or anyone that's involved in family life, you know that it's almost, it is like building a house. The only problem is you can build bricks and you can build all day, and at the end of the day, you've got a beautiful brick wall. You can invest into people, and then you look at the end of the day, and there's nothing. They turn on you, and they throw it in your face. Um, sometimes. <laughs> I think this scripture is saying that there is a spiritual dimension to our households and our families. That many of us are like the builders and we are working and laboring in vain. And God would say to him, say to them, I want you to work on your family and I want you to work on your relationships. But let me tell you that I ultimately need to build your family. I need to build your relationships. I need to build your capacity to parent. I need to build your capacity to be a good child. I need to build your capacity to be hospitable and forgiving. It says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Some of us in this room, we're like, we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about it, family members, thinking about our homes. But God sees all of the families in our city. It's, there's this picture, he sees all of our families and all of the interactions and he sees things that we don't see. Have you ever been so sure that you're right in a family situation where there's like a family dispute and you are 100% sure that the other person's wrong? 
And sometimes we just need to remember that it's God that is the one that sees all the families in the city. He sees every perspective. And, uh, and I, I think one of the greatest myths is that I, I find in, in family life or life in general, we can get so practical in trying to fix things that we are very poor at taking a step back and saying, God, there's so much about my home life. There's so much about my family life that I can't change. I need your help. And that's where the language of prayer comes in. It's where we protest our own incompetence and our own impotence by falling on our knees and saying, God, you've got to help me. And I think that sometimes is the most important thing. I find the language of my prayer is a language of desperation, right? So I'm often desperate in my family life because I'm consistently feeling like I don't know if I've got more to give when I'm up in the middle of the night and I'm just tired and I'm exhausted and I feel like, oh, I need help. And that's when prayer just starts to flow. And as I spend time with God, he reminds me that ultimately he is responsible to be the father of my children. <laughs> he is responsible and he is caring in his nurture of my children. He is caring of his nurture for my whole family. And so prayer is a language of people saying, I can't do it all on my own. God wants to shape the culture of our homes. He wants to shape the environment of our homes. Um, I remember in last year, there was a, a season where our younger son Jude was taking about two hours to go to sleep every night. It was a good season. Um, even if he was exhausted, he was just taking forever. And, you, and, and, and if you left him, he would get up and he would start waking up his siblings. So it was just exhausting. Two hours every night, and there was like a whole season where our middle son, Josiah, would get up every night for, a rec for many, many months. Every night he would come into our bed and disrupt us or not go back to bed or put the TV on. And just This was in the middle of a, a period where toilet training was nowhere in sight for both of our boys. And it was just so emotionally draining. And there are times when you can do all the reading of the books. Um, and when I say me, it's generally Nikki, because she's so diligent in reading up and trying to be just the, the amazing mum that she is. But it's so easy with, with my kids to get into survival mode, just thinking, I just need to survive these jolly kids. And, and tiredness, exhaustion builds in and that's when I needed to remember unless the Lord builds the house the laborer works in vain and um and I think sometimes we pat ourselves on the back with how hard we're laboring oh God if only you saw how hard I'm laboring and I feel like God would sometimes say I see it I'm God I see everything but are you calling upon me to build your house, to build your home, to build your capacity, to build in those areas where you really can't do any more. It goes on to say, in verse 2, it says, in vain you rise early and stay up late. Some of you are doing this right now. You're getting up early, you're staying up late, toiling for food to eat. You're working really hard in your home. But it goes on to say, contrast that, and it says, for he grants sleep to those he loves. You know, um, that is the, the mark of someone that really understands God for their family. is not someone that just works hard for their family. It's someone that is able to love their family and love their home out of a position of rest. And that's really hard. Because some of you are like, Tim, don't talk to me about rest. I want rest. But I'm too busy to rest. And I think God would say, I, th I think a few things about rest. I think rest comes from knowing what you can't control and rest comes from knowing who is in control. Like yesterday, my mum was over for a few days and I did have this random thought, oh, flip, I probably should have got a Mother's Day present for mum while she's over so I don't have to post it. And then I thought, oh, nah, too late because I thought about it like last night when all the shops were shut and she was leaving at 7 o'clock this morning which was actually very good planning by me compared to normal. Um, 
But, you know, I come downstairs and Nikki has wrapped two gifts, one that she organised two weeks ago, one that she organised this week, beautifully wrapped it, and she's got the card ready for me. And then I come downstairs and she says, can you write on this? And I'm just like, what am I meant to write? I didn't even tweet. Oh, this is for Mother's Day. Oh, you've done it. But you see, I shouldn't have worried about getting Mum a Mother's Day gift. I should have just known that Nikki would have already organised it. <laughs> because she's fantastic like that. But in family life, sometimes the only way you can rest is by saying, I choose to believe by faith that God's got this with my son, that God's working in my sister, even though she won't talk to me right now, that God's working on my dad, even though he's so stubborn and he drives me crazy and I want to give him what, and I want to tell him exactly what I think about him, but I'm going to rest because I choose to believe that God is working in his life. Because when did you ever change someone's destiny? When did you ever change the condition of someone's heart with your own words or your own anger or your own wit? Never. (laughs) Rest comes from knowing what you can't control. And rest comes from knowing who is in control. Um, I believe that to finish our time, we're going to have communion. That we need to operate less out of stress and more out of rest. I think... So often, I feel like that story about Jesus and his disciples on the boat, and they are stressing big time. They are probably trying to problem solve everything they can to deal with the problem of this storm. They think the boat's going to capsize. They are freaking out. And do you know, I, I feel like I spend so much of my life either stressing out and freaking out on the top of the boat or just trying to like hide and say, all right, hurry up and capsize already (laughs) because I can't deal with it. And I forget that right below the deck is Jesus, the Son of God in the flesh. And he is not stressed. He's resting. (laughs) And so when he comes up onto the deck, I still don't know what he's going to do about it, but I can take a big, deep breath because the only one that knows what to do with the storm and the boat that's about to capsize is right next to me. Do you need to know that in your home life? Some of you, they've got toxic home life. Some of you have got complicated home life. Some of you have just got... There's just a whole pile of things that are too complicated to go into. Do you believe that God is going to give you the rest so that you can focus on the things that you can and trust him with the things that you can't change? I believe that as we take our hands off trying to control and we are able to invest in the ways that only we can, God is going to create health in our families. Some of us from a really low base. (laughs) but there's going to be improvement. And in the midst of the health in our families, God is going to open up our families so they're less exclusive, less snobby, less stuck up, less cut off, and more loving to people that are looking for a family because God places the lonely in families.